Yeah, Sean, timing is everything in this disaster. I spoke with Sal Macagliano, who follows the shipping industry very closely, and he tells me the power loss happened at the worst possible moment. Unfortunately, the loss of power at this exact moment was the problem because a few seconds later, uh, they're under the bridge and perhaps run aground. The timing just seems to have been the worst possible for what happened. Sal Mercagliano, maritime historian and host of the YouTube show, What's Going On With Shipping, has reviewed the video of the moments leading up to the catastrophic moment when the ship struck the bridge. The first sign of trouble seen in the video is the ship going dark, apparently losing power. That means every system on the vessel went offline, and that is the worst feeling for a mariner on board. Silence and darkness is the worst. That means you've lost propulsion, you've lost steering, you've lost control of the vessel. Seconds later, the lights come back on. What we're not sure about is whether or not that is the main power coming back on or the emergency power coming back on. If it's emergency power, that means they don't have control. Then thick black smoke is seen coming from the ship's smokestack. That's usually an indication that they're trying to back down the engine that they, they perhaps may be wanting to try to slow down and stop. We know that they do drop the port anchor because we see it down in the video footage, uh, but at the speed they were going, which is about eight knots, uh, that anchor would not do anything. It would just drag on the bottom. Uh, that was a desperate move to try to stop the vessel. Officials have said the ship was moving at eight knots when it hit the bridge. 100,000 tons at eight knots is a lot of a momentum and it's very hard to control it when you lose uh, propulsion and rudder control. The impact of the indefinite closure of the Port of Baltimore will be felt across the nation. The ships that are in Baltimore are stuck and the ships waiting to get into Baltimore are either gonna have to wait or divert. And we're talking about uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollar of impact of cargo. It's not just a matter of we'll offload in Norfolk, or Philadelphia, you need the facilities to be able to take them. Uh, cargo is gonna have to be rerouted into Baltimore that was scheduled to arrive there. And again, the coal and grain that come out through that port is not gonna be able to be taken up in other facilities. The facilities just don't exist. Now, Sean and Leon, as we learned during the Ever Forward incident, the equipment that's needed to remove the debris from the ship and from the river will have to be brought in from up and down the eastern seaboard, and all that will have to happen before the port can reopen. Boy, I mean, just the, the ripple effects and the fallout, we know they're huge. We heard Adam mention it sort of a moment ago. What about the ship itself? What do we know about the crew and, and who's on board? Yeah, we heard the NTSB say they're trying to interview the crew and get an assessment of who's on the book. Ships like the Dolly have what's known as a forward collision area, which is designed to take some impact. Crews will be inspecting the hull from the inside and out. That might be delayed because, as we see, there's debris from the bridge resting on the top of the ship. One thing to watch for is if we start to see any sheen on the water that would indicate a fuel leak. Mm -hmm. You'll recall again with the Ever Forward, the Coast Guard surrounded the ship with booms to contain any leaking fluids that might have come out. We were lucky with the Ever Forward yeah. that there were no fuel leaks during that uh, incident. And let's hope there are no fuel leaks here, but there's a lot of to sort out and clean up there for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Yep. Right. Thank you, Mark.